Alexander Fuller has spent her career moving readers with her evocative, harrowing prose, beginning with her first book, 2001's Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight, a memoir of her life living with her family in Southern Africa. This was followed by Scribbling the Cat, The Legend of Colton H. Bryant, Cocktail Hour Under the Tree of Forgetfulness, and Leaving Before the Rains Come. In her newest work and her first novel, Quiet Until the Thaw, Alexandra tells an intersecting story of two cousins, Rick Overlooking Horse and You Choose Watson in the Lakota Oglala Sioux Nation in South Dakota, and the complex choices they face as members of the Lakota Nation. It is a departure form in the novel, but in it, Alexandra continues to explore the themes that have resonated in her career. Her urgent interest in the environment and the natural world, and still always the idea of the past as a living, breathing presence. Please help me welcome Alexandra Fuller back to Politics and Prose. Oh, yay. There's never been a better time or a more necessary time to be a reader or a writer. Can you hear me? Am I yelling? No, good. All right, before I do all my thank yous, I want to read a poem from, from a country woman. Freedom Nyamubaya unfortunately passed in 2015. She was one of the few female commanders during the Civil War in Rhodesia fighting for liberation after independence she wrote probably the most beautiful poem. She was a poet. I mean, you're a liberation fighter, but you know she was a poet at the same time. And after independence, when she saw the route that Robert Mugabe and other people were taking, she wrote this. Now that I have put my gun down, for almost obvious reasons, the enemy still is here invisible. My barrel has no definite target now. Let my hands work, my mouth sing, my pencil write about the same things my bullet aimed at. And this I read yesterday to kind of give me strength, really. Um, a mysterious marriage. And this is noticing Independence Day. Once upon a time, there was a boy and a girl forced to leave their home by armed robbers. The boy was independence, the girl was freedom. While fighting back, they got married. Af you've got to hear her read this, she does a much better job. After the big war, they went back home. Everybody prepared for the wedding, drinks and food abounded. Even the disabled felt able. The whole village gathered waiting. Freedom and independence were more popular than Jesus. Independence came, but freedom was not there. An old woman saw freedom's shadow passing, walking through the crowd, freedom to the gate, all the same. They celebrated for independence. Independence is now a senior bachelor. Some people still talk about him. Many others take no notice. A lot still say it was a fake marriage. You can't be a husband without a wife. Fruitless and barren independence staggers to old age since her shadow, freedom, has not come. Thank you, Mwia Freedom, my fellow countrywoman and truly my hero. So thank you, Politics and Prose, for having me back and back and back. I have obviously not been direct enough in my speech. I, <laughs> because this is, you know, I have been here, I realized, through four presidents and then, <laughs> you know, whatever this is. I don't, I hesitate to say president because i think that my if somebody's checking twitter the and while i probably between the office and here the guy's declared himself emperor are we there yet <laughs> and i think the problem with that with king trump i mean one of them is he's already called his kid baron like the guy overshot the mark a little bit my mother goes you know these insecure types that keep calling their children baron and knight and sir and and chancellor, and if you're not from royal family, just call your kid Fred. <laughs> and um, so I, I, you know, let's let's think the unthinkable. And now we have em Emperor Trump, who having, you know, now what do you have, Prince Baron? 
all the way down the road. I don't know. And then you've got this whole sort of awkward thing of taking on all these royal mantles. Let's assuming this goes this far. And you're from some obscure village in Germany, which is sort of where the Queen's from of England. So I can see where this is going. Um, but my, <laughs> my mother's great big thing is her, her massive disappointment is that, and she thinks this, she, this is the one conspiracy theory she has, that they put Prince Philip into retirement at the same time that Trump became president of the United States because if anybody is an equal opportunity offender, it has to be Prince Philip. You know <laughs> that they were, they, whoever does PR for the royal family were like, you know what, no, we could get by with the do you people still have bones in your nose in Australia to the Aborigines. We don't want to hear what Prince Philip, can you imagine? He be like, this chap seems to have yellow fever, funny color, jaundice, do you have jaundice? been in Africa lately. I mean, you can just imagine how much fun <laughs> that would have been. Anyway, instead, here we are. Um, and, uh, and everything's changed. Everything's changed since the last time I was here. I, I'm not joking when I say I really realize I have to, had to change my language. I mean, I wrote memoirs. I don't know if this is a news flash to anyone. Anyone here not know that that's prime, like this was just not what I was supposed to do. <laughs> and I wrote, uh, you know, it, it's not, um, this is not irrelevant because I wrote these memoirs about my racist family or sort of growing up boozily on the front lines of Rhodesia's race, racial war. Um, my parents were white fighting to keep Rhodesia white run, roughly 100,000 of them, uh, 100,000 whites, 6 million black people. And the whites were fighting, you know, for the power, the land, the air, the water, the dominant narrative. Um, and I was shocked, you know, when the book came, <laughs> I wasn't as shocked as my mother when the book came out, but I was shocked <laughs> when the book came out that, you know, I wasn't shocked that people sort of pointed out that we were racist and, and alcoholic. What shocked me <laughs> um, was that we were called white settlers. And I, and especially when the American press got going calling me white settlers, I thought that's the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> and then I went, oh my God, that's the pot calling the kettle black, ha. Huh. And I feel like this is something that we need to introduce thoroughly into the language, was that if you're white, you're a white settler. That's just it. If you're living in the States, that is what you are. I mean, we've made everybody else be something. You have to be African-American or Asian. Amer you know what, white settler, They're, that's your thing. And then you have to do the work of that label. The same, you know, people get this label being African-American, which those of us from actual Africa are like, look, I don't want to disappoint you or anything, but no, Barack Obama to us, no. All the Zambians are like, that guy is not African. He. <laughs> But anyway, in the States, apparently, yes. And um, so while we're at labeling, let's, let's sort of get more targeted. And the one thing um, that no one did say that took me a while to kind of get to, because I love these people who raised me, my parents, uh, is that I was raised by white supremacists. And you would think this isn't something that would sort of slip your attention, um, but it... <laughs> It did, because, you know, when you're being raised by white supremacists, they're not just white supremacists. They also, you know, your mom and your dad, and they do other, they listen to the radio and feed you and send you to school and have a university fund. And I, I didn't have, like, stupid white supremacist parents. They weren't running around in white sheets or anything. I mean, that, you know, big clue. Nothing says white supremacists like a white sheet. Maybe, but, but there were, in retrospect, other clues. Like, we were living, you know, on the front line of a racial war, and when they ran out of other white people to give guns to, to sort of uphold our white supremacy, they handed the Uzi submachine guns down to the kids, which was us, me, six. So I just want it to be known that even though now, trigger warning in case you're not, I am a socialist, I was raised by white supremacists, and I feel like this gives me a job opportunity. <laughs> if the writing thing doesn't work out, I feel like I could be rented out at very right-wing weddings <laughs> for the young couple. Or like, you know, say they plan like they're pregnant. I swear, do you want to go through with this? Because as right-wing white supremacist, the as you are, because my, mo my mother made Ronald Reagan look like Oprah Winfrey, right? That's, I mean, and she was, you know, armed to the teeth, dangerously drunk, absolutely mad, completely committed to whiteness, and she still threw 
a socialist. It can happen. And I think you just need to say this to very right-wing pregnant people. Like, look, do you want to go through with it? Okay, if you're, if you're absolutely determined you're anti-abortion, keep the fetus, but then do you want to feed it? Do you want to educate it? Because I think after my parents read their memoir, they were like, wow, educating this girl was a big mistake. <laughs> Teaching her to read and write, not great <laughs> idea. Um, so yeah, that's my plan B when all else goes wrong. Um, what was, it's, is this age, is it, I, the other really strange thing is that when all my memoirs uh, you know, were written and came out, pe one of the responses, other than that we were white settlers, was how brutally honest my work was, which made me realize every other white writer is lying through their teeth. Because, and I have proof of this, at every single reading, I would get people coming up to me being like, you know what, my fan, we're just, yeah. Uh, my mom's just like your mom, I've got an aunt, like your mom, like, no, we're, I've got this terribly racist, blah, 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 blah. Like it's another, th like it's happening to somebody else in another lifetime and another family. And as if you just sort of uh, learn to tolerate this, right? Um, and what it made me realize though, in the moment that we're at, that this tolerance ends here. Because, you know, those people who come up and they're like, well, I've got a, r you know, really racist, which let's just, if you're white and you're saying, I have a white racist relation, they're not just racist, they're white supremacists. And I think the reason why we like to use the word racist as white people is it sounds like anyone can be racist. Like you can be any color and you can be racist, and you, but if you're white, the truth is, if you're racist, you're not like, it, it, let's face it, you're white supremacist. That's just it. And I think we have to start naming these things. I think that we, the, the time to like be pleasant and calm and, I don't know, put each other to sleep. Remember after the elections, everyone was saying, now we all have to behave. I mean, what the fuck was that? <laughs> no, I am not going to behave myself. This looks like a travesty, and I am going to speak up. What is that? You know... I was so, I survived my childhood, obviously, it wasn't easy, thank you, thank you. And one of the other, th okay, here's the slightly not smart thing the white supremacists in my life did growing up. So we've got this whole racial war, we've really annoyed people by taking the land, the vote, the dominant narrative, the water, the and by the way, putting people in protective villages, which I know makes it sound like there was a golf course on site, but no, this was in 1978 when I was turning nine, the Rhodesian government instituted protective villages, which sounds nice. If you were a child under the age of 12 years old, seen by the Rhodesian government forces leaving your protective village, you were shot on sight. Shooting little unarmed black children stop me when this starts to ring a bell. Because it's ringing a bell with me. And one of the things about being on the front line, grazed white supremacists knowing you, I mean, after all, right, you're sitting there on the front line between Mozambique and, and what was then Rhodesia. They put in a massive minefield. You've been given an Uzi submachine gun and given the target of a black man and shown the difference between shooting to kill someone and shooting to maim them. This is not information that's easily lost on you. It is a disturbance that remains and should remain deep inside. It's at least worth exploring. And I explored it in all my work, and still I felt like I hadn't obviously hit it directly enough. I mean, there's still this uncomfortable, I, I mean, I want people not uncomfortably swarming. I would prefer my audiences sweating bullets at this point. This is no time to go to sleep over literature. This is, as Franz Kafka said, literature must be an ax for the frozen sea inside. It should shake us all awake. Agree with me or disagree with me, but examine your own lies, the own denial that we have our sort of way of sleepwalking comfortably through our lives. As my the weird thing is, is that the same people who sort of made me also taught me everything. My mother always said, never mistake your comfort for your security. It's not the same thing. And if you're comfortable right now, trust me, you're not paying attention. So having survived this extraordinary childhood, I moved to the States. I married a US citizen. That was all very exciting because I, 
well, it was exciting because when I met him, he said he was from mainline Philadelphia. And I thought, oh, thank God, a heroin addict. This is going to be, this will be <laughs> match made in heaven. And um, turns out not. And, but anyway, I'd, by then it was too late, married the guy, moved here. And um, I would hobble back from dinner parties with bruises on my shins because, you know, I'd get invited everywhere twice, once for the dinner party, once to apologize. But I can't, you know, as a fresh immigrant here, you are noticing stuff and calling it out, naming these things for what they are. It's, who here has seen Wonder Woman, which I love that film. Yeah, okay, go and see bloody Wonder Woman. And it's great. Her secret power, she's got all these things she can do, stab people and I don't know what, kill them actually. But her real superpower, I think, is the truth. She just keeps noticing. This thing is happening, she says. And they were like, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. In our life, you know, th th that's how things happen. And I, that's what I kept getting told when I came to the U.S. You don't understand everything. This is just the way it is. My ex-husband said to me, um, you know, just because you've got freedom of speech now doesn't mean you need to exercise it, you know, <laughs> 24 hours a day. He goes, those of us who've had freedom of speech for a few generations, we, you know, well, you're, you're like the nouveau riche of freedom of speech. We're, we're a bit more... Uh, classy about it. Um, I became a U.S. citizen, which, which was very exciting, I'm partly because I'm so outspoken, I was terrified they were going to throw me out if I kept, kept it up. And while I was getting sworn in in camera, the dentist in camera, Wyoming, was the poshest person they could find to do the swearing-in ceremony. And he said the most beautiful thing. And I'm sure it, if he knew what I was using it with, he would take it back. But he said, oh, it was such a recognition. No one leaves their home, you know, unless you really have to. It reminded me of that beautiful line from the poem Wilson Shuri, the Somali-born poet who says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And he said, so, you know, to know that, to recognize that, because in the U.S., U.S. citizens, white settlers, have been told there is no country like America. Well, no, there is no country like America, but there are other pretty great, wonderful countries that people are born in. They fall in love with that soil. They are attached to it. And then whether because there's a dictator or the economy falls to pieces or the environment collapse, all of which we are headed toward here, we're forced to leave. And the dentist at Kemmerer, Wyoming, said, bring us your hunger. Whatever it was, bring us and keep your hunger. Your hunger as an immigrant is what feeds us. That is what makes America. And he said whether your freedom is, you know, the freedom to worship, the freedom to make a living, the freedom to... For me, it was the freedom to speak. I had lived under, at that point, four dictators, two right-wing, two left-wing, two supported by the U.S., the U.K., Israel, South Africa, two supported by... North Korea, China, Russia. I mean, this is, <laughs> this matters because when I started to say about five years ago, God, the US is reminding me of Rhodesia circa 1975, white settlers in America go, no, oh no, you don't understand. It's very different from that. And I just would say to them, wait, when would, did you get raised in Rhodesia? At what point was this your experience? You don't, I'm the one who did it. And I came out of that white supremacy. I know the code. And that is, the racism that I found in the States is very entre nous, it's very settled, it's very subtle, it's not very frontline, and it's very outsourced. So the white supremacy we outsource to our government and the idiots in Idaho, you know, live in the compound. But really, rather like my childhood. So there I was with the Uzi submachine gun, you know, waving it at a target of a black man. And... There's other kids, I was six, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there, between starting at six, which is about how big, old I, I was the right size then to hold an Uzi submachine gun and be able to put it through the missing brick in the veranda wall, the barrel, so that when you pull the trigger, the, the uh, I, you know, you don't kill your whole family. That is the theory, right? Um, meantime, in... Salisbury, the capital of Rhodesia, the other six-year-olds are swanking around the swimming pool, swilling gin and tonics for all I know. They're having a fine time, and they could be as liberal as they wanted to by the pool, drinking their gin and tonics, because the real war was being done on the front lines by us. 
And that is the bit that I really want to emphasize, that if you are privileging from white supremacy, there is no difference between your gin and tonic and my Uzi submachine gun. They are all damaging. The gin and tonic might kind of, you know, numb you to the fact of this arrangement continuing, but I'm under no illusion and I spare myself least because the one thing, yeah, I'm raised by these white supremacists, right? I didn't, you don't, I mean, you guys have children. You know how influential you are. Parents, my teachers, the priests, the government, all of whom are white supremacists. How am I not? I mean, God, I think. Um, it's not because I'm some miraculous, great, wonderful person. I'm not you know, sort of Gandhi or something. I think it's because independence came when I was 11, and I was, f by force of circumstances, my school stopping, our schools weren't segregated, and I was in boarding school. I had, you know, with, there were four other white children. Every other child in our school was black, and we had, I was forced, and f not very long, actually, but it was amazing. Children learn quite quickly to listen to the other side of the wall, because all I knew until that point was what I had been told by my government and my priests and my teachers and my family, which was that, you know, God was on our side and everything was going to be great. And there should have been clues that right there we were being, you know, here's a, just in case you're under any doubt, you may be being raised by white supremacists if your God looks like he should run a compound in northern Idaho and your Jesus looks like the love child of, uh, let's see, Celine Dion and Kurt Cobain, then you might, might, or like all your family photos, all your ancestors are either with animals or they've just wiped the family out of the photograph altogether and it's just a picture of all the stallions and stud dogs in your family. That's a clue you're being raised by white supremacists. Also, here's a clue you're being raised by white supremacists is that animals have proper names. Like our dogs are called Harry and Coco, you know, Chanel, not Nut. And Aung San Suu Kyi, some of our dogs have full names. Che Guevara, we've had that. Margaret Thatcher, Scratcher was the cat. Um, and the kids are called things like Bobo and Mimi and Hodge and Tub and Miffy and Bongo and Biffy and Miffy and Muffy. Um, so I came over here and I'd, I also, at that point, I wrote, wrote this memoir. My mother was appalled. She said, well, she'd become an American citizen. It's what they do. They write memoirs about how they weren't hugged enough as children. And then they go on the Oprah Springer show. I hope that someone <laughs> hugs them. And I, I think she's right, because I ended up writing four memoirs. And I think one hug from her would have stopped the other three. <laughs> um, she was so angry about the first one. Um, but it really was a way for me to ex to, s to sort of say, you know, after I became a U.S. citizen, look, here is where I came from. This is the most honest look I can give it. Was it honest enough? I don't think so, but it was all the game I had to bring. And dismantling your own racism, my own racism, my own white supremacy was a painful mission. It began, you know, at 11, and I wish that had been it. I wish that was it. Lights changed, flick, that's it. But you know what? You're still being raised by these people that... You're still, I, I still love my parents. I mean, I went to my father's deathbed. I cried like a child when the man died. I would have followed him. I mean, he had, to watch him die was to watch his courage. That man saw death coming and he did what he always did when things got tough. He lengthened his stride, not shortened it. I love him. I love my mother's passion and her power and all of those other things. And that makes this difficult to stand up and say, and this is untenable for me. It stops in this body. I am the body between white supremacy and what comes next. But if you don't do that, it trickles through. My sister's children, her three older sons are very racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, right-wing Christian, Boy, uh, you know, adults now, they're in their 20s, but that's what we were all raised with. I mean, it's a miracle if you pop out of this. It's not something that you can take for granted. It is work, and that is the work of the white settler. It isn't the work of our Native American brothers and sisters or our black brothers and sisters who have been doing this for 4,000 years. It's this work. <sighs> wow, what a rant. So. I had been writing for National Geographic magazine for about 17 years, and it, 
so one of the interesting things was they always sent me on the shit missions. I don't, don't really blame them. So I would go to like Haiti, Angola, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. And I started to see this pattern everywhere you go, right? This incredible disparity. When you see massive poverty and inequality in a country where there is also tremendous wealth, that is an arrangement. That is a political arrangement backed up by the military, wherever you see it. I don't now write for National Geographic because that is part of the dominant narrative I am trying to dismantle and the fight with editorial got way too hard. We are so invested in a dominant narrative and the problem with that, say for example at a magazine like National Geographic, so you have to back up every fact with three or four experts. Well the experts we have arranged it are all white and usually male. I mean. We are not getting any diversity. The most oft quoted people in the English dictionary are Shakespeare and the Bible. I mean, it's a start, but it's a not a very good one, and it, our minds are so narrow. I think the moment we allow ourselves a freedom of language, including, you know what, I was raised by white supremacists, starting to say this stuff in a robust and interesting and honest way. First of all, it's hilarious. Secondly, it is truly liberating and it is the only way to be liberated. You and I are not going to walk onto Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and liberate, you know, Native Americans. That is a ridiculous, Aldous, Aldous Huxley said, liberties can never be given, they can only be taken. We have this the wrong way round. So National Geographic had sent me to South Africa to look at post-apartheid South Africa, and the next year they sent me, and I'd been begging and begging to go to the, to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation where Aaron Huey, A-A-R-O-N-H-U-E-Y, please look at his TED Talk, was doing amazing work on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation for National Geographic magazine. Um, his his work is still there. I, he, this is the cover. This is taken on the res. He's a, a beautiful, open-minded artist uh, from Wyoming, actually. Brave, very brave. And he had the res change him. The great gift for me was that I rode onto the res with 400 Lakota Indians, and I had my ass handed to me. I am a rider. I can endure. Those people are beyond. And I thought, this... I'm riding with people who are in training. I mean, talk about the meek shall inherit the earth. There were children on horses with nothing but a little bit of baling twine between the mouth and the horse. They were on 400 Indians. We rode 200 miles. I had blisters down my body. I arrived on the res on my knees, reduced and humbled and grateful and exactly as a white settler should arrive in an indigenous community. And I recognize the res for what it was. This is nothing my children who are now 24, 20, and 11 had ever learned in school. In fact, to really have it told the way, <laughs> the way that when you come over here, when you're a fresh immigrant, you think, oh, they've got different strokes on TV, they've dealt with their racial issue. Oh, they don't have indigenous people. You never see or hear about them except for the American Indian Museum. Well, that's not true. And the other thing I realized as a U.S. citizen that all U.S. citizens should be alerted to is that the U.S. government has broken all, broken, altered, or ignored all 360 treaties it has with Native American people, meaning if you're a U.S. citizen, this should concern you. Going on to the res... The other thing that became apparent was this terrible disparity. Life expectancy for men is between uh, 46 and 48. For women, it's 52. Let me say and uh, annual income on the res is $4,000. We're the most powerful nation on earth. That is how we treat the Sioux. Having broken their treaties, we ensure that continuing poverty and oppression mean that the narrative of who they are doesn't get out, but the loss is not the Lakotas. The Lakotas still have their own 
tradition and spirituality and stories. The loss is ours. It is this massive gap in human understanding. It is, I think, a terrible, terrible gap in our, uh, our wisdom, our history, our way forward. I mean, let's be honest, white settlers have not landed us in a great situation, either environmentally or socially. We have Ferguson, we have Standing Rock, we have a collapsing environment and, a, and an emperor who's just pulled us out of the Paris climate talks. Where do we go for our wisdom? And for me, the res, <laughs> should we be so lucky is where we need to be listening, but one of the elders who spoke to me, Alex Whiteplume, on whom Rick Overlooking Horse's character is largely based, said to me, before I open my mouth and speak to a white settler, the first thing I have to do is forgive you and your people for everything that you have done to me and my people. And after that, I can speak to you. It takes that level of graciousness. I wanted to write a book that deconstructed the dominant narrative, and that exposed the Lakota way of thinking in a circular uh, pattern, which was my clue as to why there was also so much serenity on the res, because everything comes around again. This idea that history is just something that's one foot in front of the other, and we're all climbing up the ladder, for the Lakota, that's rubbish. The violence is going to come around again. And you don't know where you are going to be on that cycle when it comes around again. That is the critical piece. I wanted to write about four generations of Lakota to show that generationally, this is not history. This is something going on. I chose the character of Rick Overlooking Horse, his res cousin, you choose Watson, who gets his name because his mother's so exhausted on his birth that when the cowboy asks what, wh what to, or when she asks the cowboy father what to name the child, he says, you choose. It is their, uh, it is their uh, relationship together and their decision along with the woman who I loved writing about more than anyone I've ever loved writing about except for my mother, Ladasha Brings Plenty, and her name is spelt L-E-A, and that dash ain't silent, assholes, that dash ain't silent. And Ladasha for me represented the young American Indian movement women who are taking back their sovereignty. And the two orphan Indian boys they adopt. So another big problem on the res is the so-called split feathers, children being taken out of the res away from their families. So I just want to read a few little vignettes, a little, that <laughs> the chapters in this book are a page and a half long because I did not want to take the dominant narrative for myself. Uh, there are so many great Native American writers who somehow have found what the Mashona, my people call Pasi Chigeri, which means peace on earth. It is really hard to write without Pasi Chigeri, without peace on earth, without, I know this as a writer that, you know, I require my family to hold fire for five years while I sit in my little office. Um, you know, so I'm not, <laughs> there is no such thing as the voiceless. There's only the preferably unheard. And I speak for no one but myself in this book. Quiet until the thaw. They say Rick Overlooking Horse didn't talk much. Actually, it was a little more than that. From the start, even for an Indian, his silence was bordering on worrying. I loved that about being on the res when I came back to America. I was like, God, you people are shouting. The res, everyone. Lakota is the most peaceful language I've ever heard. I didn't understand a word of it, but it sounds like uh, water and soft. And Alex Whiteplume said there's no way to be angry in Lakota. For example, in his fourth spring, when you choose Watson, shot him in the leg with an arrow, he didn't go wailing to his grandmother like any normal kid. He turned his back on his res cousin's mocking laughter and limped away with the arrow still in his leg down the hill towards the third in a row of tar paper lean-tos on what is now Second Street in Manderson Village. Then he stood in the kitchen, silent as ever, staring at his closest immediate relation. Mina overlooking horse, accustomed to her grandson's silence, took a long time to look up from the back seat of the 1935 Ford Coupe that had served as her sofa since it had been torn from its crumpled mother chassis in a ditch outside Shadron, Nebraska. 
Then she noticed the dark, viscous pool spreading on the earth floor beneath Rick overlooking horse's feet and the arrow juddering from his leg. Aye, you're making a mess of everything, she said. But Rick overlooking horse just blinked and stared at the dirt on which he was standing. Maybe he was wondering why you two just shot him in the leg with an arrow. Or maybe he was wondering how he could mess everything up any worse than it already was. But no one would ever know what he was thinking about this or much of anything else because the child wouldn't talk. It was like that swampy Cree Indian poem, quiet until the thaw, as if his tongue must be frozen. Eventually, his grandmother and some of his more concerned immediate relations thought to look in his mouth to make sure. But nope, everything was all defrosted and accounted for. Rick Overlooking Horse was simply a child and then a man of shockingly few words. My reporter boots stayed on the whole time I was writing this. So there is nothing in this book that I didn't get from an interview or story up to including the story that absolutely set me on a trajectory to write this was I met an incredible young Indian called Theo Whiteplume, Alex's nephew, and he had been recruited by Disneyland Paris to be an Indian in the Bu Buffalo Bill Wild West show, which I encourage you to look at if only, you know, Anyway, it's, sh it's an irony not lost on me that the highest, per okay, percentage-wise, demographically, Native Americans are killed by police, more even than any other demographic in the nation, including, you know, black people. They also sign on to the military at the highest demographic of anyone in the nation, and they're weeping, uh, they're, um, Sorry, the wiping of the tears ceremony that they perform at the powwow is one of the most moving things I've ever seen. And I also encourage you to look at Standing Rock. Try and Google Standing Rock war vets ask for forgiveness. And a whole bunch of white war veterans went to Standing Rock last December when uh, the Lakota were trying to stop the Keystone Pipeline go through, the Dapple Pipeline, and on their knees asked the Lakota elders for forgiveness for crimes committed against indigenous communities by the US military. You choose Watson and the sugar debacle of 1962. See if you can put the affliction with the president. It's never been so easy for a Lakota boy to worm his way out of military responsibilities. For a start, most Indians are in boarding school, already roped, as it were, when their enlistment papers came. And for another thing, it's not as if an Indian boy has a hope of getting a legal deferment to complete his education at Yale or a family friend doctor who can declare the boy fat-footed or cross-eyed or afflicted with bone spurs and therefore unfit for military service. In fact, you might say the United States Army has its fingers on an Indian boy's shoulders before the ink on his US government issued certificate of degree of Indian blood is even dry. The only other place, the only other nation in the world in which you need a certificate to prove what race you are is South Africa. And these certificates, uh, was South Africa, pre-apartheid South Africa, these certificates of degrees of Indian blood are incredible documents. I highly recommend you educate yourself on, on what that means and what uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs came out of the War Department. Um, our intentions were always very clear as white settlers. But when his notice came to report for a physical as a preliminary to being drafted into the US Armed Forces, you choose consumed so much sugar he, that he felt drunk for two days and lightheaded for a week. It was sheer genius, honestly. You choose Watson, the recruitment officer said. Is that a real name? You choose was having a hard time with his vision. He put a hand over one eye, and that seemed to help narrow the recruitment officer down to a single figure. Is that a real name, the recruitment officer asked again? Yeah, you choose said, swallowing. Nausea and mild sweats were also part of his current infliction. The recruitment officer said, stand up straight, boy. You choose Watson hiccuped and then burped, but he didn't get shipped out to Southeast Asia. Mina Overlooking Horse stared at the piece of paper from the U.S. Army Recruiting Command, Rapid City, South Dakota. She couldn't read well, but she could read well enough to see that it declared you choose Watson unfit for military service on account of his diabetes. You are what? she said. Then she looked at the birch bark wall in which she had made her winter count every year for 18 years until this year she had finally been able to write the number zero. And she said, I didn't know him well, but I believe your father would have been real proud of you. And this here is the land, which, of course, for me, the land, the land, the land. And, you know, I think as white settlers, when you take on any narrative like this, the tropes are always, you know, nobility and land and wisdom. 
But that is what I found. Um, and the land, the land, I was smitten. So this is Rick Overlooking Horse coming back from Vietnam and setting up a teepee in a meadow. Rick Overlooking Horse was never lonely on his land out there beyond Porcupine Butte. The meadow around his teepee started to fill bit by bit with creatures that must have felt comforted by his presence. First ravens, rabbits, field mice, and then a family of coyotes and an owl. And finally, one summer morning, an old buffalo bull, bull wandered into view as if he had finally found the place he wished to retire. The old bull had a rump, brand on his rump, but Rick Overlooking Horse didn't put much credibility in human ownership of the sacred Tatantanka, so he never bothered to find out from whose sacrilegious ranch the old bull had escaped. On cold nights, the bull lay up against the teepee, and Rick Overlooking Horse found he was comforted by the sound of the great creature chewing his cud, the rumble of his breathing. I live in a yurt in Wyoming, and sometimes we have bison come up against the canvas, and you can hear the rumble of their breathing and chewing of their cud. Yeah, it's like being in love. I get so excited. On hot days, the two of them lazed in the shade of the cottonwood trees where a little ground spring coursed west. Rick Overlooking Horse dangled his feet in the little stream and watched dragonflies. The old bull scratched himself against the tree's rough bark and cropped the sweet blue grass that grew along the bank. Summer moved through the meadow as waves of color. The tender purples and yellows first. Loco weed, flax, blue bluebells, mustard, then a wave of white and pink. Geraniums, chickweed, yarrow, and roses. And then, just before the hottest week of the summer, a riot of blooms, balms, and cures of all colors. Beard tongue, prickly pear, field mint, catnip, mullen, aster. The whisper of dandelion gone to seed. If anybody thinks that racism is not alive and well, white supremacy is not alive and well in the States. I live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. My daughter's 24, very um, active in social and racial justice. And she was standing in the town square for all of last summer, starting in June until, um, until the elections, holding a sign that noticed Black Lives Matter and adding to the list of names every time an unarmed black person was killed. And um, I would sometimes just go with my meditation mat and meditate. Uh, but she would get death threats, which amazed me. What really amazed me, not only were there death threats, though, but somebody posted her address online in response to a newspaper article written about her social justice work and offered to buy a beer for the first person who beat her to death. This is where we are. In the middle of writing this novel, though, my then 22-year-old daughter who was doing social justice work, the same daughter, I didn't have thousands, um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not like my sister had six kids. My mother goes, well, it's because she's illiterate. She couldn't read the little writing on the pill bottle. <laughs> um, Sarah sent me this beautiful thing, a litany for those who aren't ready for healing by the Afro-Christian scholar Yolanda Pierce. It was written in November 2014. It became the litany that I used to write the end of the book. It stays with me as my litany for how to live my life as a white settler socialist in the United States of America. And I will leave you with this and then um, take a couple of questions. I went rather long. This is the end of the litany. Let us be silent when we don't know what to say. Let us be humble and listen to the pain, rage, and grief pouring from the lips of our neighbors and friends. Let us decrease so that our brothers and sisters who live on the underside of history may increase. Let us pray with our eyes open and our feet firmly planted on the ground. This is my favorite line. Let us listen to the shattered glass and let us smell the purifying fires, for it is the language of the unheard. God, in your mercy, show me my own complicity in injustice. Convict me for my indifference. Forgive me when I have remained silent. Equip me with a zeal for righteousness. Never let me grow accustomed or acclimated to unrighteousness. Thank you, politics and prose. Thank you for coming and being such an important part of freedom of speech, which is the courage to listen. Thank you for the dignity of your intelligence. Please keep supporting your bookstores. We need, we need, we need voices, voices, voices. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to thank you for your reading. This, this for me is a highly unusual occurrence. I have no doubt in my mind that every European here is fully aware of what you just said. But to me, white supremacy is a kind of addiction. The benefits are so enormous. They really have no desire to give it up until you put them in a position where white privilege is challenged and suddenly it dawns on them that what they take for granted every day, whether they're in Chevy Chase or Bethesda, is something because of the suppression of the other. So as I sat there listening to you, I thought about Eleanor Roosevelt. And I also wondered why we don't see more like you who speak. They understand it's sitting here. It's not that they're going to change because the privilege, it's, a, it's an addiction. They are not going to give it up anytime <coughs> soon unless they are threatened. And so if it's not ISIS, it's going to be somebody else because that kind of hegemony can only make people feel really terrible. So the social writer from Canada called Jean Baudrillard, you may or may not know him, he wrote a little booklet called um, The Spirit of Terrorism. And in that he said the following, the power to increase power heightens the will to destroy it. So I don't see peace anytime soon, even though I commend you for your efforts. <laughs> but I'm not that hopeful because the whites are not going to change anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you. I think the strangest thing for me, uh, the most, you know, there's an Australian, uh, she's an Aborigine activist. Uh, it, this quote's attributed to her, and I, I, um, God, I hope I don't butcher it, but she said something like, uh, you know, if you've come here to liberate me, don't waste, wa don't waste your breath, but if you've come here because your liberation is tied up with mine, come, let's walk together. And I, my hope is that we are starting to chip away, especially the young people at this conversation and more people like, I mean, this is, I don't think that extraordinary anymore. Since the election of Trump, I think white people, white folks have woken up that we can't sleep. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, yes, sorry. I have a question. Thank you for still being the same. I You're was welcome. So afraid Stand by the microphone. To see you tonight. I didn't want you to be different from what you've been. For oh, thank God I haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> You're wonderful. But my only question is I thought I'm concerned about in the past year or two, I can't speak to my family in the, anymore. We can't talk about religion or politics. You obviously have been through this. How did you manage with? Didn't ask for permission, got thrown. I mean, I am the libtard in the family. I am mocked. And I mean, my mother, seriously, she goes, bloody socialist, you're not a socialist. You're, wa you're wearing linen. And I said, I am trying to do for <laughs> socialism what you did for white supremacy. I'm trying to make it sexy. She said, I didn't say anything about you looking sexy. You look like you're in a bloody burqa. She goes, but I looked at your labels and it's very good linen. And I said, well, I didn't want, you know, I'm not going to buy stuff from a sweatshop. She goes, yep, see, you're a socialist, you'll be working in the sweatshop. So I, you know, the thing is, is I think the one thing I've, listen, this is painful. This is incredibly painful. The only thing you can do is <laughs> the oldest instruction, noske te ipsum, know yourself. Sit on a meditation mat, go for a walk, pray, go to your house of worship, discredit every question every, as Walt Whitman said, question everything. You have been taught by your family, your church, your government, all your authorities, question it. And ignore what violates your own being. And you know what? You're going to screw it up. You're going to screw it up a few times. I always say, you know what? If you're white and you're feeling guilty, I think white guilt gets a terribly bad rap. It's a great start. <laughs> Just start with the guilt. Sit. Follow the disturbance <laughs> and take it from there. And I have stood up to my fa I mean, they, l am I loved by my family? No. My friend Brian Christie made the observation that they would be galloping across. I needed to be careful who I put the do not resuscitate in the hands of because they'd be pushing each other out the way to pull the plug. <laughs> but what do you do? You keep going. And you know, this is it. This is what I do for a living. And it's not going to, I mean, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to five years from now what I have to say because I get more and 
I see the need to be more and more radical and outspoken. And, and my own life, too. I mean, I love what Gandhi said. Integrity is when what you think, what you say, and what you do line up. I've given away everything I own. I live in a yurt. I chop water. I bring my own water from a well. At this point, I don't know. I mean, my kids are terrified. They're like, what next? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry that I didn't bring my two nieces with me tonight if they would have loved it. And one niece every day on Facebook writes, day, whatever, this is not normal. <laughs> if I'd known you were going to address any of these issues, I would have brought them. My question is, what you've said is so powerful. I'd like for many people to have the opportunity to hear what you've said tonight. I mean, thank you. I'm hoping that people take this back to the family. Be you know what? Use me. Throw me under the bus. Oh, my God. I went to politics and pros. It was this insane woman. She says we're all white settlers and white supremacists. What do you think? Listen, guarantee the white supremacist in your family prob probably has blocked carotid arteries. They'll have a heart attack on the spot. <laughs> Problem solved. Maybe you could do a TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, curious. I am doing a TED Talk okay. in August. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Question. All right. I got a question. I just came in here. I just heard about race, and I really appreciate it you talking about this. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, about, ask about not just racism in conservative, but also racism in liberals. Yeah, absolutely, too. yeah. Um, and especially here in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm not sure about Washington, D.C., but um, I grew up in a conservative part of Colorado, uh, Bush country, back back when he was um, in power. Uh, where back I live in the now good is old days. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually turned way more liberal, uh, that, that, that county. Uh, but what I want to talk about is, um, when we talk about racism, we don't talk about individual racism sometimes. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a, as a you know, person of color in this country, I always heard this horrible term called, I don't see you brown. Because my reality and your realities are just different. Uh, right. You know, because right. when I go in the airport, you right. know, I get more harassed. Right. And I hear this all the time in liberal societies. I don't yep. see you brown. Well, because that's very convenient. You're because one of if the good I see ones. You, right. That's it. That I... Yeah. Listen, I agree with you, and I think that this is that well, it is something I addressed in the talk in in Ray Rhodesia, in which I said, you know, there were us on the front lines, but the real white supremacy were the people privileging from the war that was going on in the front lines who could afford to be liberal and sip their lattes and their gin and tonics and whatever it is. I mean, those are the people I am most violently angry. Actually, the demographic I'm most angry and hostile toward right now are white women, because I know how dangerous. It is, you know, the yes. weaponized fragility of the white woman. We've all seen that. White woman having a bloody fit about something, taking up all the emotional uh, space in a room. And I think that we're starting to be a little bit more uh, graphic and honest about this. But s carry on, sorry. Well, one thing I want to ask about is that for me as a person of color, um, and, you know, who look Arab, you know, I've got an Arabic name and all that, um, I feel that me, people, s why, why, why is that? that when people say, I don't see you brown, is more insulting than calling me a sand nigger? Oh, because it's this, it is a, it's an indirect, uh, th thank you, it's a good question. It's, an, it's a further negation of who you are. Right. It's I don't see you. I don't see, having made you brown, I now don't see you. I'm now gonna make you white. And, and all the difficulties that you have to go through, I'm not going to do anything about. That's what this is code for. Because it doesn't affect me. And if I see you as white, then I can pretend that you don't get hassled at security or that you're as protected as I am or that your rights aren't being denied. And I don't have to, you know, as soon as I see you as brown, guess what? I'm going to now have to ask you, what as an ally do I do? And that is work. And presumably you will tell me what I need to do and it will be work. All right. Thank you. I got way more questions, but, you know. I'll okay. I'll Yes. Um, my question, uh, you might have been asked this before, and um, since I'm Native American, uh, you might have been asked this before. It's a little bit of a tough question, and I haven't read your book yet, so I, so I don't have the benefit of that. But you're from, you're from England, and... I'm from Zimbabwe. Or somewhere, Zimbabwe. Somewhere else, yeah. But, and I'll just quote the question that you were asked. Were you worried other, others would find it presumptuous that you were writing from the point of Native Americans, so. Thank um, you, so it's a very important question, and thank you for asking it, and 
I long for the day that we don't have to ask that question because when we don't have to ask that question, we'll be there, but we're not there yet. And yes, I worry enormously. I think it's a problem. <laughs> I think it's a huge problem that the dominant narrative for so long has come out of the white settler community. The really hard thing I had to ask myself there then is this terrible tension. Do I remain silent in the face of this injustice that I see, or do I write about it? Do I give it voice? Do I at least have this conversation? At then there is this other thing called I don't know what, the divine, where I wake, I, I mean, I think there's this idea that, that writers, uh, trust me, my mother has tried this one. I mean, can't you write something else? Um, this, you know, and no, I can't. I have to write the book that's in my system that I have thought about and that wouldn't let me go. Now, do I think that white settlers should be writing about Native Americans? I don't think that that's the primary voice at all. I do know that as a white settler, the voice that got me out of the wormhole of white supremacy was the voices of other white settlers because it made it impossible for me to deny the truth. I think often when we, you know, you read books from the African American community, it's not like there is aren't books out there from the Native American community, but that when white settlers also say, yes, this thing has been done. And in my memoir, in my memoirs, you know, I would get asked the same thing. So now you're a white settler, giving your white settler dominated narrative. Is this fair in a country in which there were only 100,000 white people, six million black people, who were denied a voice. I mean, they were actually, it was illegal to write in English if you were a black Rhodesian uh, on the grounds that you would butcher the English language. Um, you know, for me, those books were, were an important contribution. That, you know, people like Nadine Gordimer, Brayton Breitenbach, Alan Payton, Doris Lessing, and they were an important uh, stepping stone for me out and ch uh, Chenjerai Hovi, who was is really the godfather, he's passed now, the godfather of Zimbabwean letters, was asked the same thing. At We were speaking together at, at um, in Nevada. And th th the, que the question was, how can you even tolerate being on stage with this woman who represents so much that was stolen from you? And his reply was, her... Sorry. But her truth makes my truth true. You know, in other words, you start to hold all the balance of um, evidence together and it becomes undeniable. If I have contributed to the further oppression of Native American people in this book, I have not done my job. If I have contributed to a dismantling of racial capitalism through the book and these conversations, then I have done my job. But that really is... Ultimately, I don't know who is the ultimate, you know, holder of that, of well, that. Um, well, I, I, the, way, the reason why I was asking that is not along the lines of, uh, of the political uh, stuff mm -hmm. you've been talking about, more of like, if you, uh, the audience here probably can relate more to you, but if you had a Native American audience, and Absolutely. They, they, they read your book, would they feel that you properly represented what the life is. I, I, I don't know what perspective you were, because I haven't read your book, and whether you were coming you Again, were in the I minds mean, of I the Native Americans, whether you properly represented that picture, because you didn't necessarily grow up in that, that way. So to capture that um, may be very somewhat difficult unless you've lived it. So it's, that's, that's the tricky part, I would think, is. Very. Is, so. Very. Yes, I mean, that is, I agree with you. I Can I go back to freedom, Nabuya, Namubaya? I'm an artist. I mean, it's what I do. So I, but I agree with you. I mean, you, I went out on the res for months and did an extensive reporting job. But what I ended up doing was a sketch. Um, but I can't, I mean, I can't answer that weirdly until you look at the book. Have I given it to, to people from the Lakota? Yes. And have I said, look, did I represent this? Yes, absolutely. Have I taken a hammering and a scorching? <laughs> yes, well deserved, you know. Um, but yeah, it is an, uh, it's an impression. I wouldn't say it's sort of 
up and it, it can't be up to me to be both the creator and the one critiquing. You did get one thing. I, I noticed that you did get the slang Thank you. Res. You can't get that from any, anybody else. People don't usually understand the, the slang that goes on. Like yeah. Res is, is a, it's a slang for reservation. That right. They talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We are uh, pretty much out of time. We have uh, one time for one last question. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Okay, yes. Hi there. I read, uh, read your earlier books. Am I on? Yes. Okay, great. My question is actually re relates to the reservation and your observations of the narrative um, and alcohol. I worked a lot with fetal alcohol syndrome and seen what it does to the brains and the thinking of children. And I've seen it happen in other communities, and I remember reading that uh, you know, we used to lace the blankets with alcohol and smallpox. And I wonder about retaking a narrative. Has it been lost to them? OK, so you, you felt like the kids were able to take that narrative, take their own narrative. and. I mean, look, the res is a place of organized oppression, right? So getting a story right. out of there is incredibly difficult. But I also think that there's a slightly racist, uh, uh, listen, I'm not an expert. I, I am an addict, but I'm not an expert on addiction other than being, you know, personally an addict. But when people say that, you know, Native Americans and people of color and Aborigines have a gene for alcoholism, mm -hmm. at, I, right, what I want to say, I, I'm going to get around to your question. What I say is, well, that's a weird coincidence. Like, you know, I mean, no one tested the Irish. I think you find those guys have pretty good gene for. But what I want to say is that those, vo there is no, su it's, well, I want to go back to what I said before. There is no such thing as the unheard. There's the preferably, you know, silenced, and there's the marginalized. So the stories exist on the res, but you know, we're in a system that it organizes it so that it's very difficult for those stories to be made into books that make it onto the shelf. Because for that, you do need privilege. You need the privilege of time and peace and food and warmth and shelter and love and a sh you know, a roof over your head and warmth and, and you know, at least access to clean drinking water. I'm one reason I wonder is because I, um, I adopted a white daughter totally Caucasian who has fetal alcohol and, and I've just seen how it affects how she narrates herself to herself uh -huh. um, and, and that's I'm not so I'm not saying that oh you know a certain race is more apt it is it's everywhere but I I guess I wonder I worry I wonder what can be done to, for these children whether they be white or in your right. case you're writing about the res mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, for me, this all comes back to how do we, you know, work our own lives so that we are, uh, you know, noske te ipsum. How do we know ourselves and deal with our own, and you know, our own thing? We c I can't, prescriptive what can be done stuff hasn't worked. We've tried that for a couple of hundred years. What you can do on to your own self, not be an alcoholic while you're pregnant and not be a racist, that would be you know, a great start. Um, yes. But one thing I definitely found on the res or anywhere else is all this othering and prescription. What the hell? The last thing anyone needs is another prescription for a white settler on how to do anything. But for two, three, four, five hundred years, that has been an absolutely unmitigated disaster for quote unquote the other. And the white settler has, as you continue to say, carried on. Um, this has been a very important dialogue. Yes, thank you. <sighs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.